السلام عليكم ورحمه الله اللهم اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر الله اكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي الله أكبر الله أكبر لا وجاعل النور من الظلم ومخرج الصبر من الألم فملق التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم ذي الشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها 
ان الذين ارتدوا على ادبارهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الهدى الشيطان سول لهم واملا لهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين I'd like to share today's khutbah with you that has to do with a fundamental demand of the Qur'an that it makes from all people and particularly ourselves, the believers and that is in English translation roughly said reflecting or contemplating on the Qur'an and I'm sure you've heard about this concept many times before and I pray that we're able to refresh our commitment to this demand of the Qur'an myself and all of you because this is something that is one of the fundamental rights of Allah's book on us, this gift that Allah has given us. It has rights on us, and one of its rights is that we contemplate and reflect on what Allah is saying. So for starters, I want to remind myself that just because somebody has knowledge, or they understand the Arabic language, or they understand the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, or they understand the context of the seerah, and, and the, the, the surrounding knowledge of the Qur'an, having knowledge of the Qur'an and ha- having knowledge of the deen is not the same as contemplating the deen. In fact, when these ayat were revealed, they were revealed in Medina and its audience are people that are very familiar with the Prophet ﷺ because they see him every day. They understand the language better than you and I can ever understand the Arabic language. They understand the events of the seerah better because they're not reading about them, they're living in them. They're experiencing them. They're not hearing a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ through a narration. They're hearing the Prophet's own voice. They're not reading about when the surah was revealed. They're experiencing the surah being revealed. They're in it live. This is happening with them live. And for them, Allah asked the question, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Don't they then contemplate deeply on the Qur'an? Or is it that some hearts have their own locks on them? So it's a strange phrase that Allah placed at the end of this ayah. But the first thing I want you to know is I don't want you to think and I don't want myself to think that this is just about learning. If you learned more than than the requirement of contemplation or the requirement of tadabbur is met. The other interesting thing here is we think of thinking about something or contemplating something as an intellectual exercise. It's something that I have to think about a lot. But yet in this ayah, Allah, Allah associated Tadabbur on the Qur'an with the qulub, with the hearts. So this is actually a spiritual exercise. And this is a really important distinction. My goal today in this khutbah in the few moments that I have with you is two things. I hope I can accomplish both of them. But the first of my goals is to go further back and ask myself and ask all of you the same, and try to answer the same question. How do you? What are, what are some prerequisites? What are some requirements, conditions that I have to meet before I can successfully contemplate the Qur'an? Meet this condition of the dabbur on the Qur'an. And the other is about this particular ayah, the second objective, is in, in this surah, Surah Muhammad, when Allah revealed this ayah, what's going on in this surah? And in, in what context did Allah say and make a demand to reflect on this ayah? So if we get time, hopefully within the, the, the time frame, that we can get to that second part too. But let's start with the first. I read a long time ago a really beautiful work by a scholar uh, by the name of Amin Ahsan Islahi who wrote about the prerequisites of contemplating the Qur'an, Mabadi Tadabur al-Qur'an. And I want to share some of his findings with you today that I think are really beneficial, timeless really. You should, I should, I, for myself, I feel like I should go over those things every now and again because it refreshes me. So I think it will be a benefit to you also. So the first thing he says is, there are two different kinds of prerequisites. Like you know when you're taking a course in university, or you're, taking, or you're in school, then if you're going to be in, in class 3 mathematics, then you have to know at least class 2 level mathematics. Prerequisites. If you're going to take biology 2, you have to know some things about biology 1 first. If you have to go into a master's program, you have to finish your bachelor's degree first. So there are prerequisites before you, and those are called academic prerequisites. 
right? They're, they're intellectual prerequisites. And of, the, of course, the study of tafsir, the study of the Quran, it also has prerequisites. You have to study and try and master the Arabic language. You have to study context and history. You have to, there are multiple sciences that may be involved. Those are academic, intellectual prerequisites. But that's not what this discussion is about. Those are there. And we're very familiar with ulum al-Quran and ulum al-Tafsir. Those sciences exist and we're familiar with that. These are the other prerequisites. These are prerequisites for my heart. These are prerequisites that are psychological. Like what mindset am I supposed to be in? Some of you that are university students, some of your professors, they don't just tell you we're going to study this book, we're going to go over this material. They try to prepare you mentally for what's coming. And some professors do a really great job at destroying your confidence, right? On the first day of the class, they say most of you are going to fail. I just want to let you know. Right? So they, they set you up for failure from the beginning. Or other professors will come in and say, I think all of you are going to get an A. You know, except for those of you who don't want it. But pretty much, I, I'm, I'm ready to give everyone here an A. So it's a different mindset, isn't it? And your, your perception of your teacher, your professor, the course you're going to take, all of that changes because of the first words. So let's think about some of these prerequisites. The first of them that I want to put in front of you is that the Qur'an, we, I have to remind myself that the Qur'an is perfect. But my mind and my ability to understand is imperfect. And there's a big difference between the wisdom in the Qur'an and this computer that Allah gave me that has a limited processor. It can only handle so much. And so the Qur'an and its infinite wisdom, I may never be able to fully understand. Now what happens when you read another book? Somebody says, oh I love this book, please read it, some other book. You read it, the first paragraph didn't make sense to you. You say, ah, this book is nonsense, it doesn't make any sense. It's talking about one thing, then it's talking about something else, it's not coherent, it's not even logical, I don't like this book. And you go on Amazon or wherever and you give it one star and a bad review. Because it did not meet your expectations. You came to it looking to be impressed. And you thought that it wasn't that perfect. And so you gave it a bad review. This is what we do with everything. We, do, we give reviews to restaurants, we give reviews to books, we give reviews to articles, we give reviews to movies, we give reviews to documentaries, we give reviews to everything. And we critique, we're in a culture of critique. So our minds are now programmed to critique everything. There's, there's, the, there's, not, a, there's not a meal you eat, there's not a video you watch, you know under every video on social media there's commentary, critique. I love this, I hate this, this was a waste of my time, I just lost 120 seconds of my life, etc, etc, right? It's constant criticism. So we've now become programmed with criticism. Consciously and subconsciously. So what happens to a Muslim? What's the danger to a Muslim that wants to contemplate the word of Allah? Subconsciously, even though consciously you know the Qur'an is perfect. But subconsciously you can forget, your heart can forget, your mind can remember, your heart can forget that the Qur'an is perfect. And you're reading the Qur'an, you're like, how does that make any sense? I don't, I don't get it. What's going on over here? How do you even understand that? And you know, why, why is it like this? Why are these ayat together? They don't even seem to be connected to each other. And you start coming up with, dare I say it, criticisms in your mind. Right? And it doesn't help that when you start you know, because the internet is a free marketplace of ideas, there are millions, if not hundreds of millions of videos, articles, posts, criticizing the Qur'an. You know, contradictions in the Qur'an, mistakes in the Qur'an, this or that. And people send me this stuff all the time. Hey, have you seen this criticism? Have you seen this video? They're showing that there's mistakes in the Qur'an, etc. Et what is all of that mindset? Because we are in a critical mindset. The moment you're approaching the Qur'an, the way you approach anything else, the way you approach the pizza you're about to eat and say, I give it three stars. The way you're approaching a book or a movie or something else, then your ability to contemplate the word of Allah is already gone. You, you failed before you even started. I failed before I even started. I have to come to it with a heart, with, a, with an aware heart that this is perfect. And when something doesn't make sense to me, that's because my understanding and my ability to grasp the word of Allah is imperfect. In fact, in a way, the first large surah of the Qur'an, the Fatiha, after the Fatiha al-Baqarah, Allah gave us an orientation. He starts with Alif Lam Mim. Anybody reading Alif Lam Mim will know, I don't know what that means. I can't understand what this means. Why is this here? 
the previous surah said, we asked Allah for guidance, yes? When you ask Allah for guidance, now everything He says should make sense to me so I can follow it. And the first thing we read in the Quran after that, in the Mus'haf order is Alif Lam Mim. Like, oh, it's not making any sense to me. This is orientation. First of all, humble yourself. You don't know everything. Until that becomes settled in your mind, you're not ready for guidance yet. You're not ready for contemplation yet. I'm not ready for it yet. We're put in our place in a sense. We're, put, we're, we're, we're oriented to humility with just the first few words before you even begin. And so this perfection of the Qur'an is really important to, 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 to internalize. And what you do, and I do, come across, I've been trying to study Qur'an for 20 some years. I come across, across places in the Qur'an, I don't understand them. It even happens now. So reading multiple tafsir, discussing them with ulama, and I'm still scratching my head, what is going on here? And what is supposed to be my attitude? My attitude is supposed to be, Ya Allah, your wisdom is infinite, and there's some fault in me that I'm not able to see. I'm not able to grasp the beauty, the wisdom, the miracle, the perfection of what you're saying. Open up my heart. Open up my mind. Give me a fat from that, that can only come from you. Because I can't see it yet. Because this is a treasure that I'm, I have to acknowledge. I'm not worthy of it. And I've been given access to it anyway. I'm, I'm nothing. And that Allah would give me this. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِ مَا يَاتِهِ Right? Allah, Allah reminds us of the favor that He's done to us. That He appointed a messenger that recites Allah's ayat. That's not a small thing. So that's the first prerequisite, this mindset. Another prerequisite that maybe we should be thinking about, I want to keep track of time, is that we have to make a distinction between two words. Easy words to remember, folks. Knowledge and guidance. There's two, two different things. Knowledge increases for a human being. When you're a child, you know very little. When you're two, you know very little. When you're three, you know a little bit more. When you're four, you know a little bit more. When you're 40, you know more. When you're 41, you know more. When you're 70, you know more. When you're 75, you know even more. Your knowledge is constantly increasing. As your experience is increasing, as your reading is increasing, your knowledge is increasing. Knowledge doesn't go down, it only goes up. But guidance, Guidance doesn't, it's not an upward chart. Guidance is up one day, down the next day, up one day, falls off a cliff the next day. It's heading in a really bad direction one day. It's, had, it's, it's making some progress in Ramadan, then after Eid something happens and there's a, the chart looks very unstable when it comes to guidance. The, the chart for knowledge looks pretty good. The chart for knowledge is very unstable. What happens with Muslims, myself, everybody can happen is that we forget that the Qur'an, we don't come to the Qur'an first for knowledge. We come to the Qur'an first for guidance. And the thing is, we read something we've already read before. And what do we say? Oh, this khutbah is about Surah Al-Asr. I've heard Al-Asr a million times, man. I already know it. I already know it. Yes, knowledge you already have. But the thing is, you can't say just because I already have knowledge, I already have guidance. Guidance doesn't work that way. Guidance is like water. You don't say, last week I already have a glass of water, I only need this again. Allah compares the Qur'an to rain, to water. He does this for a reason. Because the earth needs to be nourished again, and nourished again, and nourished again. So actually, the second thing that will help me contemplate the Qur'an, is I will understand that even though I'm learning from it, I'm getting knowledge from it, knowledge was never the goal. Actually, guidance was the goal. The knowledge is only being acquired, not for interesting information. I'm not learning the i'rab of the Qur'an, or studying balagha, or studying different tafasir, and I'm not learning the technicalities and the ikhtilafat, the differences of the mufassirin on a, on a surah, or on an ayah, or the different qiraat. I'm not learning all of that for interesting information that I can quote. Or I can say, I read this book, and this book, and this book, and this book. No, that, that, all of that is just a step to the real goal. I want guidance from Allah. That's why this book was sent. Not because of the information, but because what that information leads to. It leads to guidance. And my heart has to always be aware when I'm studying anything. What is the guidance here from Allah? What does Allah want from me here? What is the goal? Because everything Allah says has a purpose has an objective, and that objective number one is my own guidance. So this is a second prerequisite that will help me contemplate the Qur'an. 
another prerequisite on top of that. Now I'm going to compare it to the next. It's related to the second one. It's thirst. I compared it to water, right? Water is not a luxury. It's not like, oh, you know, when I get time, once in a month I, I, I drink some water. You don't do that. Your body says, get up, drink something. Your body doesn't let you rest until it's nourished with water. It's a fundamental need for your existence, for my existence. The Qur'an is nourishment for my heart. And that heart, just like your body, needs to be replenished with water and cannot survive. I have to recognize that the engaging in the contemplation of the Qur'an, seeking guidance from the Qur'an is not a luxury, it's not a spare time activity. It's not a when I get time. If I just develop this mindset that this is a need, like water is a need, I need this. One of the beautiful ways I can think about this, for myself even, is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't just praying the five prayers, even the tahajjud, and much more prayer than we do. And in every single rak'ah, Allah has commanded him to recite what we recite, Aidina Sirat al Mustaqim, the Fatiha in every rak'ah. Why is the one who is guiding all of humanity, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why is he begging Allah for guidance so many times every single day? Every few minutes, every few hours, not even few, I don't even think few hours, within every hour. Constant, the most calm, constant request from Allah's Messenger to Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is guide me, guide us, guide us, guide us, and that includes him. So if our Messenger is in such desperate need for Allah's guidance, then where do I stand? How can I think I already got it? Alhamdulillah, people say things like, you know, I used to be really lost and then Allah guided me, Alhamdulillah, I have guidance now. Where do you have it? In your pocket? Where do you have it? You can't hold on to guidance. You can hold on to money. You can hold on to knowledge. You can have knowledge. You could have learned something last year, you still know it. You can't have guidance from last year and you still have it this year. You can't keep it. The only way to get it back is to get re replenish yourself. I have to replenish myself again, go back to Qur'an again, and get it again, and get it again, and get it again. And so the thirst has to be there. For If I'm really going to contemplate Qur'an, then I have to have that thirst. And I pray Allah gives all of us that deep, genuine thirst in our heart, that we come to Allah with that humility, come to His Word with that humility. Then finally, just one quick and, and dangerous <laughs> requirement is that the word of Allah is beautiful and the word of Allah has a lot of wisdom and the word of Allah will make you feel in awe of his, the, the power of his words but at the same time the word of Allah demands changes from me when I, when I actually contemplate the word of Allah I might find that the Quran is telling me to be here but I'm all the way down here when I really think about myself I'm not where the Quran wants me to be so I need to make a hijrah to where, where Allah wants me to be, right? And it's, we're not perfect. You can't change overnight. You're not going to get here in the next day. You know, you can make the intention and start making changes and start improving. Maybe you have really bad sleeping habits and you haven't been waking up for fajr. Maybe that's the case. Okay, you're tried the next day, you failed the day after that. Then you tried the next day, you failed the day after that. Okay, now you're starting to get up at maybe 7. Maybe you know, I was working towards 6. You're, you're getting in the habit of sleeping earlier and earlier. You're making changes, good progress, right? It doesn't happen overnight. But when you start making these little, little changes, you might find that things are getting really difficult. First of all, making changes is hard anyway. It's inside of you. There's forces inside of you like laziness like shaitan's waswasa, like your own desires, like your own you know, habits that say, come on, don't, you don't have to go that much, you don't have to be so extreme, take it easy on yourself. It's too much, you're doing too much, Allah knows you're human, it's okay. You can make your excuses to yourself, you know. And so you're, I, I love that you're only human. You're only human is shaitan's number one line, it's a very good sales pitch. You're only human, it's okay. You don't know, Allah, you're not an angel. Don't worry about it. So I tell myself, it's not, I don't have to make these changes, right? But even if I fight myself, I conquer myself, and I still start making those changes, then my family comes, hey, what's happening to you? Why are you becoming so extreme? You're only human. First you were telling yourself, now your family, you're only human. 
What do you think you are? Oh, you want to be a, you want to be an extremist? What's happening to you? Why does your face look like that? What are you? The girls are getting told. What are you putting on your head there? What's going on with you? You know, I'm worried about you. Your family starts worrying about you because you're becoming too Islamic. You're coming. You're you're trying to get closer to what Allah says, and your family's worried. First, you had to fight yourself. Now you have to. It feels like your family's at war with you. Then your friends are like, "You're weird now. I don't want to hang out with you." Or you don't want to hang out with them because hanging out with them was what's taken you away from Allah to begin with, right? So you're basically what I'm saying is the more changes you make, the more isolated you become. The more changes you make, the more uncomfortable life gets. And at every step, you're like, man, I could just turn back and life will become comfortable again. I could just take it easy. Why am I doing all of this, right? The people who can fight that discomfort, fight through it. This is sabr actually. This is what sabr is. If people that can fight through it, they will taste something that nobody else ever tastes. وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ Whoever really has faith in Allah, Allah guides their heart. They feel iman in their heart. They feel the sweetness of it. You have to go through some pain to feel its sweetness. You can't just read about it and feel it. You can't just hear a speech about it and feel it. You have to experience some pains and graduate past some obstacles. And then you can taste something. And once you have that taste, the struggle becomes easier. وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ اللَّهُمْ جَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ So that becomes easier, fine. But that's one, and I pray that Allah makes us those kinds of people that can fight through the obstacles that are inside ourselves, with the people around us, with society, with all these pressures, just push through. You know? Sometimes young men come to me and say, uh, Ustaz, I, I don't know how can, you can live a life as a Muslim. Life as a Muslim in, in America is really hard. In England, it's really hard. Why, why is it hard? It's harder than Mecca? It's harder than Quraysh? It's actually a lot easier. They didn't have halal restaurants. They didn't have lots of massage. They didn't, like, what's so hard? I don't understand what's so hard. No, it's so much fitna, really. Fitna just came, happened now. The, back then, there was no fitna. There was, <laughs> those were easy times. These are hard times. It's easier to be a Muslim now, even though you tell you this is again shaitan, you're only human, it's so hard now. Look at all the there are all the social media, so much fit. Really? Just delete the app, bro. It's easy. Problem solved. Problem solved, you know? So we tell ourselves it's too hard. Another group of people, there's one group of people, they fight through the change. Another group of people says, I want to change. I do. When I read the Qur'an and I find that it wants me to be here and I'm down here, I feel really bad, man. I even cry when the salah is happening. I cry when the khutbah is happening. Because I can see how far I am from where Allah wants me to be. I'm really messed up, I know. I just I can't do it. But I feel really bad. That counts for something, right? Because I feel it. And we tell ourselves, you know, then, then you go to someone and say, Brother, MashaAllah, just make dua that Allah gives me tawfiq. I don't have tawfiq. You know, some people are able to pray five times. I'm just not able to do it. You know, just make just, just make dua for me. Because, you know, some people Allah gave superpowers. I'm just human. Allah, I, didn't ha- I don't have it. You know, I, I heard this tawfiq line so many times. I was like, who's this guy tawfiq? Everybody's looking for her. <laughs> that once they meet him, everything's going to be fine. As if Allah didn't make you capable. Allah would not have put anything on you if you weren't capable. This is a lie we tell ourselves. This is a lie I tell myself, you tell yourself, I can't do it. It's too much to ask. It's not too much to ask. If it was, Allah wouldn't have given it. Oh, it's too hard. No, actually the goal of Allah giving me guidance is to make life easier, not harder. But the last warning that I want to leave you with, I, we didn't get time to discuss the other things, but this, that's okay. Last warning I want to leave myself with and you with is not people who make the changes and fight the obstacles. And it's also not the people who make excuses and say it's too hard. I I feel bad, but I can't do it. But there's a third category that's the most dangerous of all. You know what they are? They engage with the Qur'an. They study the Qur'an. They recite the Qur'an and even recite it beautifully. They memorize it. They're listening to it in the car all the time. But they're not interested in any of its changes. They're interested in its tajweed. 
They're interested in its tafsir. They're interested in its balagha. They're interested in its miracles. They're interested in its in interesting facts. They're interested in comparative religion. They're interested in you know, this or that or the other. They're interested in gathering a lot of information about it. They're interested in calligraphy. They're doing a lot with the Qur'an, right? But what they do is they say, my, well, my relationship with the Qur'an, I'll pick one. My relationship with the Qur'an has to do with the, the tajweed of the Qur'an. So I'm going to perfect my tajweed. It's going to be so good. And tajweed is important. But that's all it is now. Now I'm a person of the Qur'an because I... My makharij are beautiful and I'm research, I'm getting ijazat from a shaykh and all of it. But the real, what I'm really doing is, at least I do this, right? So I don't have to do the change thing. Inside of myself, I've told myself, I have restricted my relationship with the Qur'an to within my comfort zone. Please listen to that carefully. I came up with a comfort zone and I imposed that on the Qur'an. And I told the Qur'an, listen, I like how you sound. I love memorizing you. I even love listening to lectures about you. I love reading about you, I love reading translation and thinking about it. But this whole change business, this is where I draw the line. That's my life, let, let it be. I'll give you, I'll, I'll memorize a couple of your surahs though. I'm, so you, now we're dictating terms on what the relationship between my, ourselves and what the word of Allah should be. And all of those things that we do with the Qur'an are part of the Qur'an's rights, but they come second to the first one. The real reason the Qur'an came. And the reason that, is, that only gets enforced, proper recitation of the Qur'an, reinforces the reminder of the Qur'an. The study of the Qur'an reinforces the reminder and the guidance of the Qur'an. All of those other things are amazing only because of the first purpose, that is, I need to bring changes in myself as Allah demands them. And this, this is the real thing. This is actually contemplating the Qur'an. It's a daring activity. And so since I'm out of time, I'm not able to share with you, at least this time, what is happening in Surah Muhammad? Because actually, the real call in Surah Muhammad was a call to change. There were people that were being asked to go to war for the first time, they weren't used to it. Like, what is this? Why do we have to go to war? And Allah posed a question to them, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. Haven't they then contemplated Qur'an? These ayat did not come in the context of the skies and the earth. They did not come in the context of past nations. Those are all subjects in the Qur'an. Why, are they, why is that here? Because now, this newly formed community in Medina is being asked to do something that is very drastic in the name of Allah. And they're like reluctant to do it. And Allah is saying, the only reason you're reluctant is because you haven't fulfilled the rights of contemplating the Qur'an because some hearts have their own kinds of locks on them. So maybe inshallah at another point, we can discuss these locks and the, the, these, these obstacles to really truly contemplating the word of Allah. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal gives me and you and every believer a loving, genuine relationship with the Qur'an that continues to unlock our hearts. And I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal accepts our faulty relationship, our broken relationship with His word and is give, gives us the strength to improve it as every day goes by and really gives us the ultimate gift, a thirst a real thirst for contemplating the word of Allah. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazheen astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا منقوتا
أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيم يرحمكم الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ويقول الذين آمنوا لولا نزلت سورة فإذا أنزلت أنزلت سورة محكمة وذكر فيها القتال رأيت الذين في قلوبهم مرض ينظرون إليك نظر المغشي عليه من الموت فأولى لهم طاعة وقول معروف فإذا عزم الأمر فلو صدقوا الله لكان خيرا لهم فهل عسيتم إن توليتم في الأرض وتقط أن تفسدوا في الأرض وتقطعوا أرحامكم أولئك الذين لعنهم الله فأصمهم وأعمى أبصارهم أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها إن الذين ارتدوا على أدبارهم من بعد ما تبين لهم الهدى الشيطان سول لهم وأملى لهم الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إن بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثمود فللذين كفروا في تكذيب 
والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ الله